go stand in line for three hours to get the latest iPad, iPhone, tech, TV, whatever. And um, a lot of stores since COVID have stopped um, being open altogether on Thanksgiving. So like if there are Black Friday sales, um, you know, you have to go on Friday. So a couple of weeks ago, we went to uh, Walmart in Oxford where we work and the lady said that they were doing like black Friday sales and staggering them weeks leading mm -hmm. up to to Thanksgiving and the week of Thanksgiving. But we, um, we like to go out and we'll go into a store and if it's too crazy, we leave. Like we just, we're not even going to mess with that. Right. So yeah. like we went to, um, we went to a couple of places. We went to Menards cause we're in the process of remodeling our kitchen and our dining room. And so, Surprisingly enough, Menards has a lot of cool little knickknacks that are super cheap that you can get. And so we got some of that stuff there and then, you know, some more things for our house. And then um, we went to Walmart and we went to Target and Walmart looked like a hurricane hit it. But like it wasn't busy when we were there. Like we is like we missed the rush. But then when we went to Target, it was just a nightmare. There were people everywhere. And um, funny story about that. Um my amazing wife uh i wish she was here to share it but we <laughs> we go into target and i had to go to the bathroom i come out of the bathroom i'm looking for like those little sanitizer pumps to sanitize my hands and i noticed my wife's talking to like three or 20 year olds and they're in this deep discussion with my wife about does this tv come with a remote like they were determined that they had to go buy a remote for a smart tv that they were going to buy okay. and the girl was like I mean, it's the first time I've ever bought a TV. Does it come with a remote? Where's the remotes at? You know, like trying to find a remote separate from the TV. And my wife's like, it comes with a remote. The majority of TVs come with remotes. Like, and they're all smart TVs and it's built into the TV now. So you don't have to buy anything separate. It's all in one. The remote comes with it. And so like, it wasn't like she was arguing with her, but like this girl was really, really confused about the fact that <laughs> this, the TV, whether or not it comes with a remote or not. So, uh, the guy that was with them, this group of girls, walks away from the situation and goes, girls are trying to buy her first TV, and she just doesn't know. <laughs> she just walks away, or the guy just walks away from the whole situation. But they're like 19 years old and absolutely clueless about the fact that most TVs come with remotes. But that's, she's never, That's funny. She's never had to buy her, you know, never had to buy a TV before. So we, uh, we didn't buy anything in Target. Um, we also went to GameStop because our um my brother-in-law and sister-in-law uh we always ask them what we can get their kids because they have three kids you know what we can get them for Christmas and so they send us this list and uh as a fellow gamer uh Scott uh Mario has gotten more expensive with age let me tell you um my nephew Baker wants uh he wants everything Mario these days and so my in-laws, my mother-in-law and father-in-law got him Super Mario Maker 2. Mm -hmm. And then we he also wanted like Mario Party 8 or something like that. And so we put it in our cart on Amazon. And it was like in one of those lightning deals for like $45. And then it sold out. So I went into GameStop, which was also a nightmare. And the, the same game that he wanted was $60. And I was like, nope, I'm not paying $60 for this game. So I left and then I asked him what, or asked my brother-in-law, like, what other game would he, would he want? And so I ended up getting him some other, I think it was like Mario something and Bowser's Fury, Super Mario. Whatever. Yeah, Super Mario, yeah, Super Mario 3D and Bowser's Bowser Fury. Like that's that's a good game. I so like... I got that one and it was cheaper than I think Super Mario Party 8 or whatever it was that he wanted originally. But he's yeah. gonna be happy because he's literally getting <laughs> two brand new Mario games to play on the Switch. Yeah, absolutely. So, Anyway, like we we ran around and it wasn't as crazy, a, you know, crazy of an experience as I've had um, in, you know, past years, you know, prior to COVID. But like, yeah, it wasn't bad. Like, I'm one of those people, though, if I go into a store and somebody like bumps into me, I'm just done. I just want to go sit in the car because just, I'm just tired. Like, because people act crazy and but it's not been super bad the last couple of years. So did you go shopping? Did you guys go shopping at all? No, we actually, the majority was... on our well, I, well, sorry, the majority of our stuff that we bought was on Amazon. We had everything in a cart, and so mm -hmm. like we went out to see if we could find it and find like there were some kind of deals or anything. 
but the majority of our stuff was in the Amazon cart and we just bought it all on Amazon. Yeah. No, I, I we did not like mainly, mainly, you know, we got to celebrate Thanksgiving with family. And then Friday we actually got to be part of the tree cutting ceremony. My mom and dad usually will go out and cut down a tree for their living room and go to a tree farm. So that was the, the last time I did that was when my niece was probably in elementary school. She's a high schooler now. So it's like, wow, you know, it's been a long time and it's been seven years since I actually got to celebrate Thanksgiving with our families. So because, you know, we never would want to make the trek up from Virginia to do that. We'd usually just take two weeks in Christmas after Advent season was over to go celebrate with family. So, yeah, so we didn't do that. I did get a couple things from Amazon, um, you know, because there was a couple things that I knew, like some of my cousins and niece and nephew wanted so it's like all right cool and then my sister so yeah but didn't really do too much shopping i kind of stayed pretty mellow this year <laughs> well, well as... i would say too that like tvs now are so cheap that you don't even have to worry about getting them on like a black friday deal like you yeah. can get if you really wanted a brand new tv like you're only going to spend a couple of hundred dollars anyway like two three hundred dollars depending on you know the size of the tv you want and like I think we have 255 or 260 inch TVs in our house. And I think we didn't pay more than $300 for each of those. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So. Not, not bad at all. Yeah. And actually speaking, talking at, at add on to your Mario point, like there is a interview with, um, with Reggie Phyllis May before he left Nintendo and someone asked him like, well, why are Mario games so expensive? We're like Nintendo first party games so expensive. And he and his response is because Nintendo always puts out good quality that you're never going to, you know, it's not a game where you're just going to play it for a few days, beat it, and then you're going to get rid of it. Like you're pretty much going to hold on to it. And to be quite honest, when I look at my collection of Nintendo games, like, yeah, like a lot of the first party games I still keep, I still play because they're fun. Like, it's not like, it's not like if I play like Assassin's Creed and once I'm done with it, it's like, you know, I'm never going to get back to playing Black Flag again or Assassin's Creed 3 again. But yeah, I'll go back and I'll play Mario Odyssey like multiple times. <laughs> or I'll go back and play Mario Kart 8 multiple times or Legend of Zelda multiple times. So so I thought that was kind of an interesting point that, you know, Nintendo is all about quality. That's why they always put that little seal on their games, the Nintendo <laughs> little seal of quality. <laughs> well, you know, I've, you know, I've been in and out of the game, gaming world, you know, my whole life. And I played a lot when I was younger. And then when I, you know, my 20s, I kind of just stopped playing altogether. And then I got an Xbox 360 and never really played it. And then I bought an Xbox One and started playing again. And then I got a Switch last year and um, kind of leaned more towards the retro gaming. And um, I couldn't, I, I'll buy a game if it's like used or if it's on clearance or things like that. But like I was talking to our friend Jordan. And Jordan was like, you need to get Super Smash Brothers. And I I loved that game on the GameCube. But when I looked mm -hmm. it up on, I think it was Friday night, I was talking to Jordan, and it was like $65. And I'm like, yeah, it's that's insane. I'm like, I just yeah. can't bring myself to spending that on a game. And not only that, but then if you want to spend money to get the expansion packs to unlock all the fighters. Yep, so you have is... like Sora and Joker and and steve from minecraft and 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 terry from fatal fury like all these other characters it's like yeah you're but even without the dlc like you can still get a lot of fighters like almost every fighter they've ever had in a smash brothers game you can play as which is pretty which is pretty cool but yeah definitely so, um, yeah, weird story, or I guess we're calling it <laughs> Stories Gone Wild now. <laughs> we're going to keep changing this segment every week. We're going to change the name of this segment, but Stories Gone Wild. So, Micah, looks like you got, oh, my gosh, it looks like the birds are outside your house. There's so many birds on that tree. <laughs> it's like Alfred Hitchcock's outside. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <clears throat> it's like oh, the reckoning like flying through your window and coming after you <laughs> oh my cats would have a heyday bird speaking tv of, or cat tv just got real <laughs> speaking of super smash brothers <laughs> oh man um 
weird stories or stories gone wild. Um, before we start recording, Scott, I, I think um, yours is going to be a lot more interesting than mine. Um, but I I got up yesterday with every intention of um, of going to church, and I shared a couple of weeks ago that we were taking a a break uh, from ministry and, and seeking some some counseling and, and really just kind of you know go sit. And just be at church for a while and, and maybe volunteer, maybe just kind of hang out, you know, um, not be on staff and just really see what God has for us next and be intentional about that. And also uh, just get well, you know, be better. And so yesterday, last week, we went to a friend of mine's church and I shared about that on last week's episode. But yesterday I got up and I had every intention of going to church. And my wife was like, you know, what if we stayed home today? And um, I was like, mm. OK. Um, but let me tell you, for somebody who's basically went to church their whole life and been a pastor on staff at a church for over a decade, that was the strangest thing Mm -hmm. (laughs) to not go to church on a Sunday. And I know we lived through the COVID era where we were like, you know, I was still going to church and recording our pastor and doing the live streaming and stuff. And then like we went to, went through a season where we were pre-recording everything and, you know, uploading videos to YouTube and Facebook and, um, premiering them and, um, weren't, you know, we weren't going to the physical location. Um, and I was just communicating with people online at my house on Sundays, but like to just literally not go to church is the strangest thing. And, uh, again, I told Jordan the other day, it's like, I'm calling it the civilian pastor life. And it's kind of strange because it, you don't have to be somewhere on a Sunday and you don't have to lead a rehearsal for worship and you don't have to worry about, you know, opening the church up and closing the church and mm-hmm. making sure the lights are turned on and making sure the, the social media is, you know, like, it's just super strange. And, you know, I know it's not like super elaborate, like, you know, your story is going to be in a few minutes, but like, it's, it's weird. And I don't know if you felt that way after, you know, you transitioned out of the church that you were in in Virginia before coming back to Ohio, like I know that you attended church regularly and you went to different churches Mm -hmm. and kind of did some consulting and stuff, but were there weeks where you didn't go to church at all? And was it this is, was it as weird as I'm feeling today? It's um, I think in some ways it, I think it depends. You know what I mean? Like, I think the, the first Sunday after I was officially done, um, I think that first Sunday we didn't go to church, but we went in, I think we went to King's Dominion. We went to an amusement park because usually a lot of times we would go to amusement parks, but then we'd have to leave early either because we have to get back to our dog or I have to get up and, you know, get to bed so I can get up and do everything at church the next morning. So getting up and going somewhere else that wasn't church, um, especially something fun like riding roller coasters. It wasn't too weird. I think the weird part was the days when I didn't go to church and I wasn't hired to do a consulting thing or or wasn't asked to go sit in as a first-time visitor just to assess everything. Like, it was kind of like, okay, what do I do with myself? Like, I don't know what to do. So I think a lot of times, like with me starting, um, starting my doctorate program, like Sundays, it's like if I wasn't going to church or or anything and I was just sitting at home then I would you know read the bible or and start working on papers and and really just start doing that because I I needed something to do because I mean that was my life for so many years and even now like even though I'm not like writing sermons now but the fact that I'm still doing lesson plans and getting my volunteers all their teaching materials and you know even teaching kids um, children's ministry and youth ministry and, and doing all that. Like, yeah, it, it, it's one of those things where I feel more, I feel kind of more natural doing that stuff now where before it was like, okay, it's a little weird that I'm not in church and I'm riding roller coasters, but at the same time, it's like, I kind of enjoy it (laughs) in some ways. It's like, I enjoy just actually not having to be somewhere on a Sunday um, for once in my life. Um, 
but yeah, so I think so. Yeah, I think it is a little strange when you when that's your life for the whole point, and then you just don't go, and it's like, okay, what do I do? What do I do? Like, I think it's why people in their older years struggle so much with retirement because for the first time in their life, mm-hmm. they just don't know what to do with themselves. <laughs> oh yeah, and I know some people who they retire from their job, and then probably after a week or two, they're doing something like, um, you know, I, it's funny. I was talking to a lady here at the church I attend, and she's like. Oh yeah, my husband was a was a school teacher in the community for many many years. Retired and then literally after about you know had summer and then two months into the new school year, he finally signed up to be a substitute teacher, so he can go occasionally. And so like every Tuesday and Thursday, he'll go and he'll substitute teach, and then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he'll just you know not just sit at home and kind of enjoy retirement but he just can't do it for weeks in because he's just like i have to do something like i can't just <laughs> be in my house so yeah i definitely get that um, well i've shared i've shared this before i think on this show but i'm not completely sure but um my grandfather um didn't graduate high school and he worked in the mill the steel the steel mill uh here in middletown in southwest ohio um, didn't graduate high school, went to the mill, worked, invested some money in real estate, bought several properties in the area. He retired, Scott, at like 52 years old. And so he he died at 82. So he spent 30 years just being able to do whatever he wanted because he was able to retire at such a young age, which is so cool to think about. Um, whereas I think I'll be, uh, I want to say 62 when I retire 63. And mm-hmm. so we're uh, I'm a long ways out, my friend. But anyway, um, kind of the other weird story, like I know I have another one bonus story um, was that Alicia and I really didn't do anything for Thanksgiving. Uh, our family, yes. my, um, my in-laws were out of town. We usually have Thanksgiving with them, Thanksgiving dinner. And um, they were out of town and uh, my family was nowhere to be found. So, I, we cook stuff. Um, we cook, th- you know, the traditional Thanksgiving dinner and we ate some for lunch and we ate some for dinner and we just sat at home all day and watched movies and watched football. And it was kind of a great day. It was weird because we didn't have the full blow up, not blow up, but full, like full on, um, Thanksgiving experience with friends and family. It was just the two of us, which is cool. So, Oh Yeah. Definitely. Scott, Scott, I hear that your story, however, is is quite fire. <laughs> so so let's just let's just start. Let me just talk about the opening of Sunday morning, because I think that's going to set the whole pace. So Sunday morning, get up like any other day. I get up, get dressed, head over and start getting stuff ready for Sunday school. Um. So I get there in Sunday school and then occasionally, you know, I go and I walk into our contemporary worship space and um, I notice the projectors are not working and the, I, the, the it's never guy, a good day when the projectors don't work. So the tech guy's trying to figure out, and this is also because we just finally officially hired a contemporary leader after just kind of a search and kind of a tryout. Um, finally have a worship leader. So now they're going to start doing live streaming of that service. So they do that. So the cameras are set up. Everything's kind of set up and there's something wrong with the projectors. They're not working. Okay. So then I go and then we have a, our kind of our, I've our hospitality pastor. She went and got bagels for everyone in the morning. And usually there's like a guy that's there who always makes the coffee. Well, the guy who makes the coffee is not there. So I just kind of asked, I said, Hey, is Bill is Bill here? And she goes, he's supposed to be here. And he never called off or said that he wasn't going to be here. So I'm kind of worried. So I'm like, okay, let me go. And so now I start making the coffee and start getting everything ready. And then the other thing, weird thing was I go into the contemporary service. And usually we have like a couple tables on the outside for families and kids that they want to color. Um, and then we have like your normal like chair seating, um, kind of like in your traditional like settings. Well, it's all filled with tables. And I'm thinking, oh, are we doing something different for Advent? Like, well, no, Bill was supposed to, when Bill gets there early in the morning, he's supposed to take down those tables or at least half the tables and stack chairs. 
So then Bill comes in, he's in a rush. He's like, sorry guys, sorry guys. And he's just like, now taking down tables and we have 30 minutes before service is supposed to start. So it made me think about our uh, topic of volunteers and how volunteers are very important. And yeah, volunteers are very important because if we didn't have volunteers, there'd still be tables set up and no one would have their coffee. Um, and it was just nice that everyone was willing to jump in and pitch in knowing that, Hey, someone's running behind or somebody's down. So we're just going to go ahead and, and, and do that. So, so at the beginning of, Sunday was kind of a little like hustle and bustle, which, you know, sometimes those days happen. So then we have youth in the evening and, and our youth group meets from four to six. And I uh, go at about three 30, I walk into the church. And when I walk into the church, it smells like someone just like lit a match and blew it out. But it was just that strong lingering, like sulfur burnt sulfury smell. And I'm like, okay. So first thing I do is I go up into the sanctuaries and I check and make sure nothing was burning in there. Nothing. And then I'm like, okay, that's weird. So then I go downstairs, I get the youth lounge open, I get everything ready and I'm still smelling that burnt smell. I'm like, that's weird. But then I keep walking around and I don't smell it anywhere else except for like in the hallways and the stairwell. So finally, you know, students are now showing up. So, and I'm still kind of walking around. I'm like, okay, I'm still, so I'd, Ask like a teen, hey, do you smell like a burning smell? And they go, yeah. I'm like, okay, good. Like, I'm not crazy then. So then finally I go and we have this old fellowship center down in the basement. And there's like this uh, mechanical room, which has all the lights and stuff, our whole lighting system, everything. I'm like, okay, it's starting to get stronger from this room. Let me go open it. So I open up the door, turn on the light. It's filled with smoke and it's like, and I'm coughing. I'm just like, Ugh, it just smelled so bad and so strong. So then I call our building manager. I'm going, hey, I found the source. Here it is. All right, call the fire department. So then I call the fire department. And I think the city of Columbus had sent every single fire truck. <laughs> to our, I mean, literally, you could hear them a mile away. Even even I looked, I was occasionally like was looking on Facebook after everything was done. And someone goes, man, a whole crap load of fire trucks started flying down Broad Street. <laughs> and, and But yeah, like it seemed like there was like at least 10 or 12 trucks that came to the church. So finally, I'm out there. I'm telling the officer, I showed them where it was. The fire department does a clean, clean sweep around the entire church. Cannot find a heat signature. They tell me that, yeah, it almost smelled. The smell that you're smelling smells like someone like set off a chemical fire extinguisher. And I'm like, okay, did you find a fire extinguisher? Well, that's the thing. We don't see a fire extinguisher or any residue that would kind of confirm that it is a fire extinguisher got set off. And I'm like, oh. Okay, so they checked everything. We opened up every room. They looked around everything. They couldn't find anything. They have no clue, no clue where that smell's coming from. They just know that it was very strong in this one room. So I'm like, okay, we might want to check some, have an electrician come out and just check the wiring and see if something is going on. So it's funny because then the kids are outside and they're all texting. But then there was like a, a teen that was in the neighborhood that came over and noticed some of her friends were there. And they're like, Oh, what you guys doing? What happened? And they're talking. And then she's like, Oh, can I join youth group? <laughs> so then, in line, so then I said to kids, I'm like, okay, they gave us the all clear. We can go back inside a church or we could go over to my house and have youth at my house. They all wanted to go back down into the youth room in the church. I'm like, okay. So we went back down and they're all coughing because the smell's still there. Even though we have the windows open to air it out. So I had to like shut the youth room door to kind of block the smell. And then it was fine. And then we just finished having youth group and play game. And I'm just like, wow, that's, <laughs> I'm just like, my goodness, Sunday. It was just, but still, I even called the pastor. I even called the building manager, gave them updates. And it's like, they, they the, the, the fire department doesn't know what's wrong. They, they, they recognize there's a smell and they could, and they think it's this, but there's no proof that it is what they think it is. And they can't find any other heat signature or any other issues or even their little like sensors, the tech for gas, like nothing, like yeah. completely. They don't know. And I'm like, oh, cool. So but, but I they gave know. you so the all clear. Work, yeah, they gave us the all clear. Like, yeah, you can go back inside. Everything's fine. There's no heat signature. And maybe that's why, like when my dog woke me up at three o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom, there's a part of me that was like looking at the church going, OK, is there smoke coming from the church? Is it on fire? Like. I don't know, man. 
<laughs> so it was weird. It was definitely probably the most unusual experience. But hey, we got a new member. We got a new team for our youth groups out of it. So that just keeps ticking up my numbers in youth group. <laughs> Unusual circumstances brings more teens to my church than anything else. <laughs> hey, hey, scripture tells us to you know to pray without ceasing and, and to send out a fleece and uh <laughs> your smoke was maybe the fleece. Yeah, my smoke it's it, it maybe maybe they thought our church was Catholic and they're putting out the little <laughs> urn. We we got a new pope. Here's the smoke. Yes. Scott, you should have came out with the robe and the the papal hat. And... Well, the funny thing is, is right by the youth room, we have all these like robes for our children nativity play that we're doing. It's mm-hmm. like, dude, I could probably walk out there. That's why I have the clouds behind me on this video. It's like, there's the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. So, Micah, we were talking about our topic today, and you talk, said it'd be a good conversation to talk about life groups, small groups, and I thought that was an interesting talking topic. So yeah, kind of like talk a little bit about small groups. Did you ever, were you ever part of a small group? Did you, were you part of churches that did have them? Um, Yeah. So, you know, just talking about life groups, I texted you. I mean, we talked a little bit last week about Advent and kind of the theme. And I think it'd be cool if we did like a mini series uh, just talking about like the different elements of church uh, over the next couple of weeks. And, you know, we did Advent last week. Today we're going to talk about life groups and, um, I guess simply put, Scott, what, you know, what's your opinion of life groups, you know, like, I, in reference to the church and, you know, what they're called, what they're not called, what, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, I think for me, I mean, I've known some people I've called them small groups, life groups. I know some people call them tribes because I think tribes. that was based off a, I think that was based off a, I, I can't remember the pastor, but that's what he'd call them. He'd call them tribes. Cause I don't know that I've ever called, heard them called tribes. Yeah. The first time I ever heard about small groups, someone called them tribes. Yeah. Do you guys have tribes in your church? Like what? Like, like Gad and, and Judah? Like, no, no, no. Like small groups, but you know, we call them tribes. No, you know, I was always part of a church where everything was so small that it didn't really make sense to have a small group. Um, And then even in Virginia, we tried to implement a small group. And, you know, a lot of times people, especially older congregants, were resistant to it because they're just like, well, we have Sunday school. Yes, we have Sunday school. So why would I need to do life groups? But then but then the same people who said, why do we need life groups? were the same people who complain. How come young people aren't coming to the church? And I would always explain, well, if we have a life group and you're hosting it in your home, then you can invite your neighbors or or you can invite your friends. And sometimes it's that it could be life groups can kind of become a stepping stone to get people to not only understand the gospel of Jesus Christ and understand what a Christian life looks like because it's being modeled within the home. But then it can also be a little stepping stone to get them into be part of a local congregation. Um, and even though there are some people who did know that and, We even and we did life groups differently in Virginia because we have like our permanent ones that would meet. But then we'd also do like kind of seasonal ones, too. So, you know, there'd be a women's Bible study and they'd go through a topic. And and then after the topic was done, they would take a little bit of a break and start back up again. I would do um, a couple different book clubs. So like if we were reading a book, like one book we did, we did a study on hospitality comes with the house key. And and then we'd always have a meal and we talked about hospitality and why that's important. I did a small group on the spiritual disciplines. I know some people who their gift was knitting. So they wanted to do a small group where they knitted blankets and they would give them the homeless shelters. Um, And the others did like a small group where they taught people how to make meals and cook. And so they would go and they get together, they make recipes and they have a devotion and, and then they learn how to make food and then, you know, to help people make nutritious meals instead of just going out and getting fast food every night. So, um, so yeah, so that was kind of my experience with small groups. So I never really had like a small group that was, you know, well, it's young people or just like people just meeting and having a devotional um, and doing that consistently year in and year out. It usually was always just any type of year in year out. Small group was always within a Sunday school setting. Right. Well, you know, Scott, you bring up a good point about the size of church um, and how they 
you know, they can look at it in two lenses. One, they can say, hey, we have a Bible study and that can mm -hmm. be considered our small group. We also have Sunday school. Um, I think part of the reason, and this is just an opinion, you know, I just want to preface with that. My wife and I were talking about it a couple of weeks ago, but like, do you think that part of the reason, I, and I, again, I don't know how Sunday school is at your church that you're at now, but like, I think part of the reason people struggle so much with Sunday school is because it's on Sunday and it's an hour before the service they're attending. And so it's literally like they're attending services back to back. Mm -hmm. So like the idea of um, that being considered a small group can be considered. However, I think it's, it's kind of frustrating and people aren't going to want to invest. It's hard enough to get people come to come. It's hard enough to get people to come to church on a regular basis for one service, let alone Sunday school and a service on a Sunday morning. So um, I've been a part of various ministries in various churches that have done life groups differently in every setting, right? And some churches, uh, you know, smaller in size will do Sunday school. Some churches that are small to mid-size will do um, do life groups and do exactly what you're saying, Scott. And they will they'll meet in you know either at the church or in people's homes. Um, they will do service projects and outreach projects to, um, you know, do kingdom work. And then they will also, uh, you know, have parties together, meet together, you know, do Bible studies together, do different studies, Scott, like you're talking about with different topics, um, you know, the gospels, uh, their, uh, I've been at churches where life groups are, are marriage enrichment, um, mm -hmm life groups, uh, financial peace university, uh, financial groups, um, you know, but also I've been at churches where they've been super intentional about how they do life groups, meaning they'll have life groups for, um, certain ages, certain age groups, um, meaning, you know, student ministries, children's ministries, if they do children's ministry, um, and that may be more of just Sunday morning experience with children's ministry, but with student ministry, they'll have life groups within youth, but also in reference to the adult, uh, small groups that they have, um, you know, a young adult group, they have a twenties group, they have a thirties group, they have a, I've been to church where they call the older people, like, I don't know, prime timers or the, 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 the senior adults or whatever. Right. And well, I like, so, I like the name prime timers better than like heaven bound or glory bound. Cause then it's like, <laughs> well, I literally, I had a guy, I had a guy who said that was the name of their Sunday school. And he says, yep, this is the last Sunday school you'll ever go to before you go into a nursing home or die. I'm like, wow, what a sales pitch to be a part of this, <laughs> this Sunday school. So, yeah. So they, you know, as far as, as far as the um, the different you know age groups, you know that's uh, something that I've been a part of in reference to being very intentional. Um, the The other thing is the times of year that they meet, and and the last two of the last churches I worked in, we had like a fall semester and a spring semester, and um, they would take the summers off. Yeah. Right. So give it kind of a break and give, you know, once they have that small group system in place, they would, they would, um, they would meet in the fall. They would meet in the spring. I think they would take like a break in December during Advent and, you yeah. know, meet back up in January and then go through like April or May. And then they would take the summers off and then they would pick right back up again in August. And if you wanted to like, uh, to be more specific, we, there was a church, um, that I worked at where we did, we did fall life groups, spring life groups, and your fall and spring life group, the, the group of people that you were with would stay the same. And then in the summer, when you took a break, we would have like family Sunday, like the first week of August or friend day, the first week of August. And um, that would be our fall kickoff. But we would also have life group signups during that season so that when we get ready to kick off life groups in the fall, um, you can join a new group. You can change your group. You can continue the group you're in. You can add people to your group. Uh, but kind of the hope is to you, that you get to a certain point and you break off and you start in the group. So like you keep, you know, adding groups and the whole point of groups is to have that more intimate setting. Mm -hmm. But um, 
also uh, I wanted to add this really quickly before I, you know, ask my next question, but do you, um, another thing that I was, I was thinking is that we, you know, with the, with the conversation of life groups of being in the fall and the spring and taking the summers off and, you know, meeting with the mm -hmm. same group, we also were very intentional about the following the sermon series that we were yeah. in. We weren't just going off on, I mean, yes, there were topics and, 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 things that we kind of like, you know, did on the side, whether it was marriage enrichment or, uh, you know, grief counseling or whatever it was, uh, a grief share group. The, the idea was to, if we're doing, you know, a sermon series in the fall called, um, I don't know, the Beatitudes and we were doing, you know, the gospel, the gospels and, mm -hmm. um, pastor would write, the life group books to go along with the sermon series. So if it was a six to eight week series, we'd have a book that would go six to eight weeks with the questions in it that we would share in our life groups so that we could go along. And I think that's a good marketing strategy because you just keep, you know, your life groups run parallel with what's going on in, in your Sunday morning experience. So it keeps you kind of engaged with what's going on. Have you ever done anything like that, Scott? Or what do you think about that? We've we've done something like that before. Like we've done things like I think when we did um we did a series on um on Circle Maker by Mark Patterson. So we would have groups. I know the big time, I think if you ask anybody when's the last time they've been in a group, if they've ever been through purpose driven life or or that material, then they always would encourage people to do conversations in groups. Um and that's a lot of times when I would talk to us about small groups of people or at any churches, they go, oh, yeah, we did a small group when we did the purpose driven life studies. I'm like, oh, OK. Um, yeah, so it was so we kind of did something like that. And in some ways, I think that's better because it kind of gives more depth into what the pastor's talking about. Like if the pastor's going through a book series and the pastor's preaching on whatever topic and then it's like. Okay, now you're going to go down deeper into your small groups. And and I think that was always kind of good. I know where I talked with one church, I was helping one church out because they were doing this. And the issue they had is they had a group that met, they had a group that met Sunday evening. But the problem is, is when they started it, they would have been the Sunday evening group would have been covering last Sunday's group. So they're like figuring out, okay, how do we get the Sunday evening group to start. I don't know how they did it, but somehow they messed that up. So it was like, well, how do we get this Sunday evening group to, because when they come in here to sermon, and that was the thing, it was like you study something and then the sermon was kind of the exclamation point instead of the sermon kind of being the sentence and then the small group being the exclamation point, they reversed it. And then they had an issue with this one class because it's like, well, now we're going to be preaching the next week's topic, but they still haven't discussed the first week's topic. So yeah, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, but I think that's also very good too. The only, I think the only drawback to that type of formula is, you know, depending on your mission and your vision of why you have small groups, if it's just to kind of do sermon stuff, that's great. But if we call them life groups because we want the church to kind of have life together and do it in a smaller setting, um, if you're too busy talking about the material, and then when are you actually going to encourage one another and pray for one another and kind of have that openness to be able to be open and to how the spirit's leading in case if somebody's having a bad week and they really want to share and talk about it and have brothers and sisters in Christ encourage that person and pray over them when they can't really do that because they're kind of guided to a to a script yeah, and you know, I was going to share Acts two, um, mm -hmm. kind of in our you know discussion, but like I was reading it as you were talking, but like Acts two and verse forty two, it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowshiped together. They broke bread and they prayed together, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And those who believed were together and had all things in common. So like, um paraphrasing a little bit but like the the idea of life groups is they did life together right they 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 break you know that even in the book of acts in the early 
you know, New Testament church, they were, they were doing life together. They were breaking bread together. They were praying together. They were doing mm-hmm. the things that, um, you know, Jesus instructed them to do. And I think, you know, I, this is kind of a, I don't want to say rhetorical question, but Scott, like, what's the point of Sunday school? Right. Like if, 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 if you're looking, if you're considering Sunday school, your life group, like you're not breaking bread together. You're not, you know, you're not really doing, you're just showing up early to church and hanging out for a couple of, you know, an hour before service. And you're, you know, yes, you may pray together. Yes. You may have a topic and a book and a curriculum that you follow, but is that, if that's your life group model, I'm kind of, but if, if that's your life group model, then how, you know, how is that breaking bread together and learning together, doing life together? If you're just showing up at the church and let's take it a step further, Scott, do you do life groups at the church or do you do it in people's homes? Like you were talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think and I think that's a I think that's a good question because when you do look at the early church in Acts uh, two, um, you do see a lot of elements that Sunday school just doesn't have. Mm-hmm. I mean, meeting together, devoting themselves to teaching, praying. Yeah, that's great. But the problem is we see is that there's other things that don't necessarily. Um, fulfill any of that other stuff. And especially if you're doing it in church or home, I don't think it really matters, but it also, you have to be careful as far as, well, are you actually breaking bread? Are you actually sharing a meal, whether that's literally where you're having food and you're eating, or is it figuratively like you're just invested? You know, you're kind of in a home. It kind of creates a homey atmosphere where everybody's welcome to come to the table of Jesus Christ. And I think that's kind of a, key thing because i mean even when you look at small groups there's a lot of great things about them but there's also a lot of bad things you know they could get very clickish they can kind of be divisive i i can i can think of a church that i was a part of where literally there'd be times where one of the sunday school rooms would be without a teacher and somebody would say oh let me go and let me go. I can I can be the teacher of that group. And then the class would be like, well, no, 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 no. We we don't want you to leave. We want you in our class. And it's like, well, wait a minute. If someone feels called or feels passionate about leaving the group to go teach another group, and if they feel like that's something that's on their heart or something that they believe God has called them to do, then don't kind of shame them and say, well, no, we want you to be part of our group. It's like, that's that's not the point of a life group. Like, yeah, it's a point of having people in your group that you can connect with and that you learn from. But if people feel called to go serve in another group or to lead another group, that should be fine. I mean, and then that's the other thing too. Like when you think about the book of Acts, there's that scene where, I think it's that scene that where Peter's in prison and the, and and people are in their homes and they're praying for Peter. And that's when the angel comes and opens up the gate and tells Peter to leave. And then Peter's knocking at the door of the church of, of the house group. And everyone goes, who is it? It's like, it's Peter. It's like, no, Peter's in prison. And then they go, no, it's Peter. Peter's outside. And I think that's just so fascinating when you think about a, a life group or a small group is that, you know, when you're meeting in homes, are you praying not just for the people within your own circle but are you praying for other people other people who are struggling within the church other people who are dealing with an injustice in their lives whether they're a member of the church or whether they're a member of the community that the group knows are we praying for those people are we empowering them and lifting those people up and i think that's kind of a big thing because even though they did life together you know life wasn't just life within the group it was life within the church at large and with the community at large and the small group should kind of be that, you know, kind of like that um, five hour energy drink that you consume so that you can be on guard and on point and energized to go proclaim the gospel to outside the home and even serve within the larger body of the church. So that's all good. That's wonderful, uh, wonderful stuff. Good points. Um, what at what point, how big a life, how big should a life group be? And at one point, should they break off and start another one? That's a good question. And I would say, I don't know if I would give a number. I would, I would give is I would give probably more of a rating of effectiveness. Okay. 
And I think as a small group leader or leaders in that small group, do you feel that, A, can I adequately care and help lead and guide and disciple the group of people that are under my care as a small group leader? I think that's the first question one would have to assess. I think the second thing you would have to assess is, am I discipling? Because if you're able to disciple people within your small group to the point where if you do get to, if you started as 10 and now you're a small group of 50 and you're all crammed in a house, uh, maybe at that point it's like, okay, is there anybody who can kind of lead their small group? And I know there's going to be some who feel so connected to the small group. They're like, oh, now we're going to leave. And it's not necessarily, well, yeah, you have not necessarily, well, we're getting too big. So some of you are going to have to leave, but more of, hey, that's a great thing that we're getting big. Let's split off into like two or three groups. Let's go ahead and meet, have those things. And then occasionally maybe like once a quarter, we can all kind of meet together and have like a big, a kind of like a big life group. And I think that's actually how, um, I think that's how Saddleback Church started. Rick Warren did a small group in his garage in Pasadena, California. And next thing you know, they kept splitting off, getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And then finally they just became a church. And well, I, I think, think that- that's, I think that's the story. But yeah, I think when it comes to size of small groups, I mean, I think it has to do with effectiveness and are you discipling? And especially are you preparing people that once you guys get big, that you have enough people within the group that can lead their own groups and kind of splinter off? Yeah, I think that if you look at it, just like with what you said, uh, Scott, with like Saddleback, for example, if that's the way they did it, like if you do churches right you do life groups right like that model those those two models can parallel one another right so if you have a bigger church and you need to plan another church and you know do satellite campuses like and follow that if you find a, a model that works for you um there's no reason that they shouldn't work right like there's there's no reason that the um if you're planning churches, if that that model works, you can plan another church. If and, mm-hmm. and the life group, same thing, same goes for the life groups. The uh, the idea of, um, you know, planning, uh, planning a church and then following the models of this is how we do life groups at our main campus. This is how we're going to do life groups here. Like it's just, um, uh, you know, I think I've shared before on this. I don't have it in here, but in my office, but the the book Simple Church, like. The the idea of just keeping things simple, I think we overcomplicate things uh, at times, and um, it's it's just a fascinating conversation for sure. Because like you know, like you said, if 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 we get a life group and it's growing and there's thirty five and forty and forty five and fifty, you know, it gets out of hand. And like if you want to split it off, and people are like, no, I want to I want to stay here, I want to stay with this group, I, I like being with this group, I like the fellowship we have. Yes, there is a there is a great. Um, there's great camaraderie in that and there's great fellowship and conversations that can happen within a group that size. And it's great. And praise God that you can have a group of 50 people. You could go start a small church with that. However, when you go to split it off, it's like, man, are we being obedient to what God is telling us to do and, and, and really be the new Testament church. And, you know, if you're in a group of 50 to people, you know, 50, 45, 50 people, how can you, um, even in that setting, Scott, be like, intimate with the conversations that you're having intimate with with the the friendships that you're forming intimate with the the relationships of accountability with 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 jesus and and how your spiritual relationship with the lord is going um it's it's one of those things that you can um it can get out of control similar to the the smoke situation you were talking about earlier yeah, in yeah. church like if you if you just let it go then you know um it's it's a it's a balancing on other episodes of the show and you know um my i guess my answer would be that you know it's it's kind of profound and simple but like jesus had 12 right and i'm not saying that life groups have to be 12 people and that's it but like you know let's say that you know you have a leader a life group leader and that life group leader and his wife decide to be one of um one of uh, six couples, right? And so six couples equal 12, mm-hmm. right? If you have a group of those people that are in their 30s, there you go. There's a life group. Same thing with our 40s and 50s and uh, not the not the heaven bound class, 
God, God help us. Uh, <laughs> that's hilarious, by the way. <laughs> Heaven bound. Um, but <laughs> yeah, I, we should do a podcast on that. Weird names of things that we've seen in churches over the years. <laughs> um, oh my yeah. gosh. I, <laughs> if we're going to do that podcast, then definitely there will be a lot. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier that you've heard them called tribes. What are some other names that you've heard life groups called? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like know. Any other, any, like, so like, I mean, uh, I mean, besides tribes, that was probably the weirdest. Well, have you, but... what, what are some other generic names? Like the, when I worked at River Hills church, we called them connect groups. Hmm. Uh, one church, I called them, they were small groups. One church was life groups. One church was, uh, um, experience groups. One church is experience groups. That sounds very cultish. Well, what does tribe sound like? <laughs> that's at least that's that, at least that's biblical because there's the twelve <laughs> tribes right. of Judah. Right, right, right. I, I I got what you're saying, but I, you know what I mean. Tri- like, be a part of our tribe groups. You know, like it just sounds kind of. Or, or I mean, I, I I mean, I think I've had other people do discipleship groups. Yeah, discipleship, discipleship groups. groups. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone called them like churches. Like, oh yeah. We're gonna be in this these small churches and call them small churches. Like <laughs> Yeah. But yeah, I you know, I really don't have a whole lot more to add to the conversation, but I think that yeah. like um do you think they're important to the ministry? And what would you say to churches that aren't doing them? Um yeah. I'd say if you are I say if you are um I say if you, I think that regardless of your size, like, I mean, if you have a church of 12 people, maybe a small group's not right for you. But one of the things I would um, do is instead of having like your Bible study at the church, do it somewhere else, do it somewhere else. Like even, even do it like out at like a restaurant. I mean, not like all the time, because I know that could get expensive if people are buying food and stuff, but, you know, do it at a coffee shop, do it at a restaurant, or do it at someone's home. Um, I say that would be good. And then even move it around some. So, like, let's say if you're doing it at brother, like, brother Micah's house, or whatever you want to call it. I'm, I'm Again, I'm using the small, small, small church phrases that I've heard over the years. You're going to brother Micah's house. Well, then Brother Micah can not only prepare that and kind of prepare the space, but maybe Brother Micah might say, hey, we're having a gathering at my house and ask his neighbors to come over and they just experience that. And then when it's over at Sister Susie's house, well, then Sister Susie can prepare a thing and talk to her neighbors or her friends or coworkers and say, hey, I'm having a, an event at my house. Why don't you come with? And just pitch it as that. And then that's, I think, a good way for a church of 12 to really start kind of getting their name out in the community, start people kind of understanding a little bit more of what the gospel is and what it is not. And then, you know, and you could probably start to see some good growth um, just by doing that model. If you are a church that is of a hundred or more, I'd say if you're going to do a small group, that's great. But I think you also have to train your small group leaders, especially people who can, navigate and guide and make sure that a we're on point with our mission we're on point with kind of the vision of what we're going to do for uh the church and what this group is about and then also make sure that if there is if it starts becoming too clickish or even if it starts getting away from being a group of discipleship and kind of becoming more of a self-help uh counseling set group counseling session within the home then you might need to start you might have to like cancel small groups and then kind of reevaluate and then relaunch them again, just to make sure that they're kind of staying on mission. Um, you brought up a great point and I was going to kind of wrap it up and have one more question, but then um, you kind of uh, got your gears moving. <laughs> well, you, you brought up an interesting, interesting thought. Like what, what happens if somebody shares something? Um, in a small group setting that's super uh, personal, but it's also like, you know, I don't know what, uh, a great example, but do you know where I'm kind of going? Like what yeah, if somebody, yeah. share, what if somebody shares something that's super private, but it's also like you're obligated to share 
uh, with the police? Like, what if there's domestic violence? What yeah. if there's and, um, and what if there's sexual I'll, abuse? What if there's you know, uh, I, I don't know what. The, yeah, and I, I, I get that, and I think that has to go back to how well your pastoral strap trains these small group leaders and again we don't have to train small group leaders to be counselors but we have to let them know and what i always let my volunteers know what i let every church i've been to know is that anytime when someone tells you something and there is a either and this goes from like not only as a pastoral counselor but the times where i would need to report to the police about something is if a there's any signs of any type kind of like physical or sexual abuse, whether it's towards a adult or children, I need to report that. Even if it's in the You're confidentiality, obligated. I mean, I'm obligated to. Um, I think the other thing is that you need to report it. Um, and I think this is where it gets tricky. Like, yeah, if it's something that's really personal, um, and it could either put someone else's life in harm, or even if they're harming themselves, if they're talking about self mutilation, self harm, or suicide, then yeah, you need to call the police and make sure they get help or that person gets help, or even just make sure that gets reported to a social worker or somebody. Because at the end of the day, and I know sometimes that's a little bit hard because we've, I've read a lot of case studies where, there's been times where people have gone to church leadership to report stuff and church leadership has kind of like turned a blind eye against it because it's like, Oh, well, no, they can't, that can't be right. Because brother, brother Harold is, you know, is a good person. Like, you know, a member of elder board member, there's no way he's beating his wife. Yeah. And then when you, then, then when everything comes out, because then the police investigate it and they find out, yes, it is true that Brother Harold has been beating his wife, then everyone's shocked. And then it makes the church leadership feel bad because they're basically basing their decision on kind of what they're able to witness and see within a public sector and not necessarily see what's happening privately in the home. Because sometimes those could be two different things. Mm-hmm. And it kind of throws people for a loop. So I think in the end, if there's something that is sensitive, if there's something that you believe that needs to be communicated, I would say communicate it to pastoral staff first. So that way the pastor kind of knows what's going on so that the pastor or the staff who might have a little bit more credentials to handle it can. But then I would say if it's very serious, like violence, domestic violence, uh, abuse, uh, sexual assault, any of those things, then yeah, it, it needs to be reported. Yeah. And I think and I, there's even a difference between, I don't know, I don't want to say difference, but there's a difference between like, especially like with sexual assault, if it happened like a day ago versus, oh, it's part of my testimony. It happened five years ago, but then like no one really knew about it. Then I think there's something where you're going to have to have a talk to him and say, hey, if you were sexually assaulted five years ago and you never tell anybody, your parents, your 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 boyfriend or husband or even a counselor or a police officer, then I think you still might want to just because, you know, you can't hold on to that. You have to tell someone because you just can't hold on to that stuff because eventually that's going to lead to a lot of men- not only severe mental illness, but it could lead to things like self-harm and suicide too if you're not dealing with a lot of those tra- strong traumatic situations that they were in yeah and that's um, my opinion and i and i totally agree 100 percent um kind of the last question as we we wrap up uh the conversation about life groups today um what would you say scott to a church that is either a thinking about adopting a life group uh, system or be converting like from the traditional Sunday school to more of a life group model. Um, what we, that's going to kind of make that transition. Yeah. So I think the first thing you need to do is investigate on what works. And a lot of times you can, I mean, really the best way, if you want to understand life groups is call a church, like a neighboring church that has them talk to their pastoral team about how they do it. And even and even as a pastor of a different church, I'd say 
if there's a church down the street that does life groups and you want to learn more about how they run and how to do it, there's no better way to learn than actually just be a part of it. And even ask the pastor saying, hey, I'm thinking about starting a life group. Is it okay that I talk to you about how you guys do it, your how you run them, kind of your mission? And then would it be possible for me to sit in a life group for you know a week or two just to kind of understand the culture of a of a group and got kind of learned that? And if you have a church that's willing to do that to help you out, then sure, I think that would be the great thing. I think you need to do that first so you can figure out, okay, from my experience and from what I've learned, here's how I want to try to approach doing a life group within my church setting. I think the second thing you need to do is have a clear vision of what you're doing and kind of, and then also have a team of people who would be, who would basically would volunteer to kind of be small group leaders and kind of empower them to start recruiting people to be part of their small group. And then once you get your team in place and you have a vision in place and you've already kind of, have that experience, then I think that's when you need to clearly communicate to the congregation why it's important, what you need to do, uh, why it's important, why we're doing this. Here's the mission. Here's the goal. And then not only say sign up for a small group, but then also have your leadership team, that you, the, your volunteers that you recruited to be small group leaders to go talk to people, build those relationships and say, hey, will you be a part of my life group and then go from there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, any other thoughts you want to share about life groups before we kind of just wrap it up? I mean, I think I've said everything that I need to say about life groups. Um, I think we've covered things about, you know, what to do in a situation. Um, and I think at the same time, you know, if you're a leader in a life group and let's say this is your first life group and maybe you've come across something and not necessarily something to the degree that Micah and I were just talking about, like in cases where someone shares sensitive material. But if you ever get to a point where you're just like, man, I feel like I'm overwhelmed. My group's growing, which, you know, praise the Lord, my group is growing. But now I feel like I don't know how to lead properly. I don't know if I need to split my group off. If you ever get to a problem where you're just like, I don't know what to do. You know, just do the humble thing and just always ask for help. Yeah. Explain it to your pastor. Just say, hey, I know you've assigned me this. I still feel passionate. However, my group has been growing. And now I feel like I'm at a, at a crossroads now where I feel like I may not be effectively discipling people as I am. Um, even if you're to the point where you're not, maybe your health has taken a turn and you maybe you got a diagnosis and you're like, oh, no, I'm, I can't lead a group now. You know, talk to your leaders, talk to your pastor or even... Talk to the pastor first, but then even talk to your group. Say, hey, I know I've been leading this group. However, some things have changed in my help and my health. And right now I need someone to be able to rise up and kind of take over the leading things. It says, oh, I can take a step back and really take care of my health or take care of a personal issue or a professional issue or a family issue. And I think there's no shame in always asking for help or no shame saying that you have to take a break and step back just so you can get your own affairs in order. I think that's wise. I think that's biblical as well uh, to make sure that, you know, not only that you're serving the Lord faithfully, but that you're taking the time to have that reconnection. Cause I think a lot of times with any type of leadership, you can feed so much and lead so much into people and then you never take time for yourself. So if you get to that point where you're off balance, you need to get back in balance, then feel free to, have that conversation with your pastor, have that conversation with your small group to switch roles and kind of go from there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, friends. Well, thank you so much for listening to the Scott Stemmon podcast. Hopefully this uh, topic on uh, life groups, small groups, tribes, discipleship groups, um, experience groups, whatever you want to call them. Um you know, hopefully this has been helpful. And hopefully for those of you who are leading ones or churches who pastors or leaders who may be wanting to start one, hopefully this has given you at least a good, a couple of tools in your arsenal to be able to do that effectively within your own ministry. Um, again, thank you for listening to Scott Simon podcast, and we'll be back on next time with another episode. Take care. Mm -hmm.